Creatives with AI Podcast, the spiritual home of creatives curious about AI and its role in their future. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the Creatives with AI Podcast. We've got a very special episode for you today. This is our one year anniversary, and I thought it was only fitting in celebration of one year to have our very first guest from way back in I think our original recording was something like March of last year, um, even though it didn't go out till a little bit later. But to have Wo back on the podcast so we could have a conversation and see what's changed over that past year and to kind of take a look back and see, you know, Wo had some predictions and, and some thoughts on things at the time and see what's actually changed in the middle. So, Wo, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a year. It's... Um... Yeah, it's been, I've been in tech close to three decades, never known anything like this. Um, I think it's kind of thing that is a once in a generation or many generations sort of um, um, movement that's happening. And what's been really great is not necessarily the advancements in the technology, but in the stories behind it and the narratives. That to me has been some of the most interesting things, the things people don't talk about, um, what has happened behind the scenes. There's going to be films made of what's happened over the last um, uh, few months. And I don't think Agreed. people understand yeah. even close to not what is going to happen, but what has already happened. And that to me is, has been the most exciting thing to be part of. Because we come from a very sort of contrarian, as you know, from that first one, right? My viewpoints are very different from a lot of other people in AI. Um, very, yeah. very different. And so, yeah, I sort of come this in a very, hopefully not being a contrarian for contrarian's sake. It's just because the people we deal with and what we do, it, um, it just is meant to be that way. And great for the success of the, the podcast, David, that it's still going. And, um, and it's great the fact that this podcast um, is needed in order to communicate out to people what these changes are. Well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, there's tons of stuff to get into. <laughs> I remember the very first thing that you said on the last part, the very first thing was sell your Google shares. <laughs> <laughs> and today... Today and today we're gonna have today we're gonna have Google. Um, There's a big thing, yeah, go and on. I would have said up until today, Google had it, and if they're gonna do what I think they're gonna do, this is their only way back, and it's a great move, and we'll talk about it in a second. All that, or Sandy so, yeah, Charles gotta go. Do... Yeah, go. I mean, yeah. I don't see how he yeah. can still be remain CEO. Yeah. No, that's that's fair enough. So just before we get in the weeds with all of this, um, just for a couple of minutes, maybe for the people who didn't hear your first podcast and aren't longtime listeners, can you just give a quick recap of sort of how you got where you are today and, and, and what you're doing now? Okay, so yeah, my name's Wo King, CEO of High Nine, and we're an AI company. And um, I got obsessed by artificial intelligence um, about eight, nine years ago. Uh, been closed in deck, sorry, in tech on and off close to three decades. And I became obsessed about how technology can help people on low incomes and disadvantaged communities access services. So I started doing user testing in um, homeless shelters, old people's homes, not asking permission, just going out there weirdly. Um, and where no one had ever gone before. Um, it's sort of a sector that profits, uh, for profit companies don't go to. Um, it's sort of seen as something only charities and the good go to. And I wanted to change that and treat these yeah. people as users like anyone else. And so this has been a very long process. And we became part of Google Launchpad. We're part of Google AI um, International Network now. But we were part of Google Launchpad there. Who Google were really good. And I'd go up to Google and talk to Samsung and talk to other big companies about how this is when the sort of diversity initiatives were starting uh, because of um, um, an engineer at Google had written a, um, a let's say, ham-fisted memo <laughs> um, and about women in tech. And there's sort of been a, a lot of sort of panic in the tech companies and they were thinking about diversity, they were thinking about inclusion, and they excluded social. They excluded people on low incomes. And I'd bang on about it. And, you know, me from a 
uh, private school background, middle class, and trying to give a voice to these people when these uh, the tech companies wouldn't talk to them. And in the end, I just started, I sort of, in the end, my old uh, company just was starting to wither anyway because um, I was concentrated so much of this, started up a new company, and then we started uh, to build things. And this was about three, four years ago. We got, got a big uh, project down in Cornwall, built the first Cornish AI that helped people on low incomes access services, uh, which is called Debbie. And uh, we did huge amounts of different things. And we're doing massive amount of different things here. Lockdowns hit, which put everything back and stalled everything but now we've launched in a whole host of initiatives and working with many different partners and hopefully during this we'll talk about it but i come from artificial intelligence then from a very different angle what we build is for everyone but we build from the bottom up first um we've got a saying that if you build for everyone then anyone can use it and so that's sort of our ethos um it doesn't mean that we are a charity it doesn't mean that uh, what we build is just for people on low incomes. It means the fact that we start there first in the design and talking to them, and then everyone else can use what we build. Brilliant. No, that's amazing. And how I know you talked a lot about demographics last time, or not a lot, but we did talk about the demographics. And I remember when it, and I, I tell people, I tell so many people about our very first conversation because you said some amazing stuff in there. And I've I've talked about it for the whole year. And I remember one of the things that you talked about was the fact that the very young and the very old actually seem to interact with AI much easier than kind of the people in the middle because they just talk to it and yeah. they let it sort of do its thing. So is that still the case? Have you seen any change in that? Have, has there been any change in maybe the way that demographics use AI differently or is it is it still pretty much okay? So was? I'm going to say things which are overpopulation. So when we're in uh, data science, when we talk about populations, we talk uh, that means a large amount of data. Okay, so uh, on average. So I know people are going to go, well, that's not my experience. It's not what I do, right? So yeah. okay, <laughs> data science is all about overpopulation. Caveat noted. Right. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. now I've done that. Um, yes, women. Right. Um, I, this wasn't a surprise. Yeah. So we. When I find time, I we do these training seminars, and uh, this is with Software Cornwall, and uh, we uh, people come along to learn about AI, and it was it was predicted, but still crazy to see. It was like being back at school. So you would have we'd have like I don't know fifteen twenty people turn up. These are very intensive, one day a week um, over a, a month. And we would have like women who are mainly in communications, PR, grant funding, all those sort of um, uh, professions. And then we'd have engineers who are mainly male who would want to learn about um, AI. And they would sit down and there would be like school, the engineers sort of on one side, right, mainly, and women on another side. And by the end of the session, the engineers turn up going, oh, this is technology, this is going to be you know, our thing. Some of the engineers would start leaving, right? And the women, again, right, in these sort of sectors, mainly women, of course, there's blokes in these sectors as well, would be using and creating with the AI in a really productive way. And the engineers would be lost, absolutely lost. Because I mean, we had in our initial team, a linguist and a creative writer, is that what I knew and what I realized is that people who can creatively communicate abstract thoughts can get the best out of AI. If you can't do that, you're left behind. I'm the past. Right, I keep on having to say to them. I used to have to carry on learning about maths and coding and engineering, right? I now have to learn about uh, uh, grammar and creative writing. Those are the skill sets I need in AI. So that is actually relearning how to be a human being again, right? Weirdly, right? So the so in technology, there's been hundreds of thousands of uh, jobs being lost um, because of AI. And the people who could abstractly communicate um, thoughts are people who are communications writers, um, content writers, um, 
business um, relation people. But these are mainly women in these sort of areas, but there's men, of course, right? Um, these people can use AI really well. People who can't, who see the world in a very simplistic world and can't do that, are being left behind. And the example I gave you about children and old people reinforces that, and we're seeing that more and more. And that, to me, is really exciting. And I knew it was going to be the case, but to actually see it happen in real time has been absolutely you know, phenomenal. And um, this may be, you know, when people say, what's it like? And I sort of do this line of, don't, you know, uh, people ask Bill Gates, what's this revolution like? And I do this cheesy line. I've got these lines now because um, of the amount of events I talk at and things. And uh, they say to Bill Gates, <laughs> yeah. what's it like? And he says, always oh, like the app store. And I say, no, it's not. You shouldn't ask people in tech. You should ask historians. I don't know. It's like the invention of fire or the printing press, right? We have never seen anything like this, but just like the invention of the printing press, and I sort of go on about this again, right, is that we don't ask the inventor of the printing press, Gutenberg, how to write a great book, right? We ask William Shakespeare, but William Shakespeare mostly couldn't build a printing press. So why are we asking Sam Altman, the head of OpenAI, how AI is going to be used, Right. Why are we asking yeah. Elon Musk? Why are we asking the Gutenbergs how to write a great book? They're the wrong people. I'm the wrong person. And my job is being gone out to find the right people because they can communicate better than I can. And we keep on asking Gutenberg how to write a great book, and it's the wrong people in the discussion. Love it. I, it that's a great thought. And I've never really thought about it that way. And um, and I think you're absolutely right. And I think the other thing that people forget about Sam Altman is Sam Altman isn't a technologist. Sam Altman is a finance guy. Mm. Like, he's an investor. Yeah. Um, he's not really a technologist. No. And, um, you know, I think people lose sight of that as well. And uh, it was interesting seeing him when he was in London. And I've talked about this in the past. But, you know, it was his discussion when he came, you know, he 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 very much just talked about the the financial impact that AI could have. You know, that that's all he was talking about as, you know, how much efficiency it could deliver and all this other stuff. And it was somebody, I was at an event like two days after that, and somebody else that I was talking to was there and they said, yeah, it seemed like it was an open AI board meeting. It didn't really seem like a public event. And um, yeah, yeah so, so I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. and. People, this is why, you know, I think there's going to, it must be movies made about this, is that the Sams of this world are going around and people are talking to him about AI, right? Uh, which to me is kind of crazy uh, because he's most probably not in Gutenberg. He's just whoever the banker was who gave Gutenberg the money to build a, a printing press, right? W w definitely wouldn't ask him how to uh, write a great book. But exactly. The that, okay, what is happening? So these stories, which I'm going to be past, you know, uh, telling you about, this isn't about AI. It's another two-letter acronym, which is what this is about. This is about EA, right? This is another story which is happening underneath the AI story. So do you know what EA is? Right? I'm actually technically part of the EA. So EA is effective altruism. Yeah. Right, and there's there's an, a, a camp right. called Acce uh, accelerationists, right? And Sam Altman and all that group are all effective altruists. Now, you have to sort yeah. of give what this term means. So th this term is sort of goes back oh, about ten years, right? And this is the idea that to do good, to have a better society, should be data driven, and that if we are data driven in our thinking and we actually see results, we can create a better society. And the example that is always given, and it's actually it's a good example, so um, what they've, so these were sort of people in Silicon Valley who you know, made a huge amount of money, and they kind of see themselves as masters of the universe, and they could maybe change society for the better in other areas. I should really include myself in, in this because that's kind of what maybe I'm doing, right? But I'm doing it thinking about the user. They're doing it from a top-down sort of way, a very much top-down sort of way. So 
Effective altruism, a, a given example, is that if you see like the charity work that happens in Africa, go and dig a well, go and build a school, that sort of thing, right? They said, okay, how about if we just gave people money, right? We just went along and gave them other lump sum or we gave them a per weekly amount of money and then we see, does that work instead? And they started to measure and they got really good results. Instead of thinking of like this, we go along, get a picture on Facebook, oh, I went to Africa. Actually, we don't go along at all. We just, people make best decisions about their own lives, and these societies make best decisions about their own lives. We just give them the money. What then happens? And so it was sort of those sort of ideas started to happen. I could give many, many stories about effective altruism, about that's actually a really great way of thinking. I've, like, I've... Since I've been in this sector and met lots of NGOs and charities, I'm going to be polite here. Their incentives are not aligned, a lot of them, with their users. I've met a homeless charity who said to me, our job is to get rid of homelessness in this region within two years. And I said, well, have you told your staff? They said, what, that you're going to fire them? Well, no. It's like, well, you're not going to then, are you? And she looked at me like I was just crazy, right? I bet, like, large <laughs> yeah. charities. And yeah. their only interest was to make money, no, to, to go for money in order to do something in an area with poor people that they can then spend the money on mainly administration, create these sort of good stories and bring it back. The effect of altruism is sort of very much going against that way of thinking. Now, that was where it started, where it's now, it is a very weird space. And why Sam Altman got booted out was there's an internal fight between groups in the effect of altruism. There's accelerationists who want to go full bore, and there's other ones who just want to be more careful, right? And Sam Altman is an accelerist. Acceler I can never say the word, right? <laughs> it's just Ac ACC. It's a sort of accelerist. Yeah, right. Accelerist. ACC. Everyone yeah. just puts ACC. Now... When Sen Altman went around and he did that summit and he did met all the world leaders is because he sees the role as of using AI to implement effective altruism from the top down. That scares the bejesus out of me, right? My passion is to do that from the bottom up, to give the individual the power of the AI. What happens if you've got a homeless person, artificial intelligence? That to me is what I'm trying to do. What he's trying to do is what happens with good governments and large organisations, artificial intelligence. And so that's why he's meeting. I've seen many, many interviews with him. I'm sure I'll never meet him in, the, in, 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 in this life, right? I've met, you know, some big people in tech. I'm sure I'll never meet him. And um, what I have seen is his personality has certain lacking in some areas. If I have Michael Monaghan, Michael Monaghan uh, interview... Go out and watch it when Michael Monaghan used to be reporter of Vice. It's an eye-opener of an interview of what Sam Altman could be like. And so he's a prickly person with a certainty of his own, um, own self-worth. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's all that world of Elon Musk. I mean, Elon Musk used to be great friends with the founders of Google uh, they used to go, go around the house all the time, talk about yeah. AI. Then he, uh, he helped film OpenAI and he poached Ilya, who used to be at uh, Google. And the Google founders never forgave uh, Elon Musk. They fell out over that. There's a whole like narrative and story of about 10 people that is running this. And yeah. it's about falling yeah. out. It's about conflicts of personality. It's all the human things, right? Yeah. And yeah, so those exactly. stories are fascinating. Meanwhile, this revolution is going on. And it is a wild ride to be on while these 10 people quibble and compete. Yeah. Isn't part of effective altruism as well the kind of the idea? Because I've, I've heard, I'm sure I've heard Sam Altman and some of the others talk about kind of about the the fact because people will raise to them the idea and they'll say yeah but the technology can yeah you know it can be used it's got the dual use problem right it can be good or it can be bad and you're going to find bad actors and and there's going to be problems and they just go yeah 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 but tech will sort that out 
And it's like they just completely dismiss the fact that, you know, that that anybody could do anything negative with it because, uh, and a lot of the, I'm going to say this, a lot of the tech bros seem to have this same thing where they have blinders on that they only see the positive aspects and they just, they can't, when you say, yeah, but what happens when somebody does this with it? And they go, but I can't imagine anybody would do that. And you're just like, I can't believe that they can't even understand that, you know, bad people are going to use this technology to do bad things with it and that they need to, to work around that. And then they just say, they just come, the, and I think it's a way they justify to themselves, but they just say, yeah, 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 but we'll just, we'll figure that out. The tech, you know, we'll, we'll figure out tech that we'll, that we'll do that later. And it's like later never comes. And by that point, it's way too late. You know the the horse is already bolted by then. But that's you know, the we're that's seeing the this act. already with AI. That's, yeah, that's accelerate um, accelerating nature. Uh, break things, ask right. permission later. Now, okay, this gets we sort of in this weird. We would like to talk about AI, but actually the narrative about is about something else. I completely agree, and these people are fighting to the death. And they're in strange situations with strange things happening that they don't know how to deal with. So the CEO of, of when Sal Altman got kicked out, the CEO of Microsoft, it was like the wildest thing. So before Sal Altman got kicked out, they, they were doing a launch like they did last night of something. And the CEO of, of Microsoft got up on stage like he was Sam Altman's sidekick. Right? Microsoft's future is based on the wins of a non-profit. That's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, Sam yeah. Mormon gets kicked out because there's the fight uh, amongst uh, effective um, altruists. And see how Microsoft are going, we're a trillion-dollar company, right? You can't – this is the most important bet on our future because, remember, they don't own OpenAI, <laughs> right? So they are yeah, – right. they are, but they're – They've completely and utterly connected themselves to OpenAI, and they've got no choice. And he's going, wait a second, you can't play these games. This is serious business. And he's after the destruction of Google. I mean, he came up with that line of, I want Google to dance, and I want people to know I made Google yeah. dance. Right? This is, this is like the talk of mafia. He's brilliant, by the way. He's my favorite. Right? Um, and... <laughs> yeah. And so, therefore, these games these people are playing about this effective altruism power play has real-world consequences stretching into not the billions, not the tens, not the hundreds of billions, but now the trillions of dollars, uh, the very future of our civilization. And it's like 10 people. And that, to me, is kind of crazy. And the only person, the only person who's coming out this really well, and I predicted this, I predicted this one I got right, right? The Google share price still went up. I didn't understand how if you still got um, – I mean, they had such a – like um, uh, so many uh, – uh, what's it uh, – where businesses already were using Google. It's just really hard to move that away, right? I still – up until today, I thought Google was in a yeah. lot of trouble. But is Mark Zuckerberg. With Llama 3 open sourced, Right? Now, that was a brilliant move. Remember that OpenA is a non-profit that was supposed to open source, right? Everyone's forgotten yeah, that, ex was. except they're being yeah. sued, right? <laughs> um, yeah. But Llama 3 has been open sourced, which is really exciting. And Mark Zuckerberg, I think, has been really great in this area. And it's good that we've got the computer AIs. Uh, but, yeah, this is – so when you were talking about them moving so fast, remember, right, this is wild – so Google fired two boards they had, what disbanded two boards, which were supposed to oversee the ethics of AI. The second board is because it had one member of the Republican Party on it, and the rest refused, and so it just disbanded. Microsoft fired their senior AI ethics team, fired them, because they were getting in the way, right? Um, I think it's Twitch fired their AI yep, ethics I know team. About this. Right? Yep. Yep. Did yep. you see the guy who fired them? <laughs> So I was no, saying no. to Josh, right, who works here, I said, I bet it was a middle-aged, balding white guy, right, who went into these very diverse <laughs> group of very ethical, like, AI yeah. people and went, you're all fired. We looked it up. 
guess who it was? Sure enough. <laughs> he got his day back, right? And it's like, that's so sort of, sort of, you know, it was sort of a cheap joke, but it was like, you know, he's mostly been ragged on for, for quite a few time, years and finally he gets rid of the AI yeah. because they're getting in the way. The reason why Google's in yeah. so much trouble is because they have a culture that because they freaked out all those years ago about uh, anywhere the, the James uh, um, Dunmore uh, memo all the way up, is that they, they are captured by a culture that, as you were saying about, so we've got this, it works both ways. Is it, yes, they're not thinking about the ethics of this and they're moving really fast, but if you think too much, then you stop. And Google's in the too much. And so, therefore, they don't know what to do. It feels like with them yeah. that they've got to get rid of Sandra Pichar and someone like Elon Musk has to come in and just go, you're all fired, all right? We've got, we're an engineering company. That's the only way. But up until today, because of something something I didn't see coming, I don't think anyone else saw coming. So we, we, we'll, keep, we'll keep saying, I'm going to tell you what it is so we can get people still watching so your uh, analytics will be good. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. We'll save that one for a minute then. <laughs> well, in, yeah. in case you have to wait it, it, when anybody's end. listening. Or near the yeah, end. So I don't right care where you, where you go, you're going to have to find it. There you go. For, for the people listening, we had yesterday we had OpenAI make a big announcement that everybody had been waiting for, which I think on one hand I think was a big announcement, and on the other hand I think it was slightly underwhelming. Um, but today we have Google – and their I.O., and they're going to make a big announcement today. And then we have the Apple uh, Developers Conference coming soon in the next few weeks as well. So there's a lot of news coming out around these big, huge companies all talking about AI. And, and you know, it's all a, a competition at the minute. So this this is what we're on about in case you're listening to this later. So it'll be very anticlimactic because you'll have already had all the news. Um, but sticking with ethics for a minute. So... Do you think any progress has been made in addressing any of the ethics issues from a year ago? Or do you, th again, do you think we're sort of just st still in the same spot? I used to, we've got, we've got internal ethics uh, called, we call positionality. Um, but I used to like do talks on this, I'd be asked about it. And it was something that a lot of people would want to talk about. My viewpoint is now it's over, it's done, right? Um, we're not talking about it. And in, in the end, we can't, right? The, the, the problem is that what we're trying to do is turn around and go, is, what is a good ethical AI? Now, when we all decide on what is good ethics, then maybe we can. But we've been talking about this since ancient Greece, right? Exactly. And we still haven't yep, sorted exactly. it out. So when we've sorted that out, maybe we can. Okay. So therefore, this isn't about creating an ethical AI. There's certain things we can all agree on, right? There's certain extremes we can all agree on, right? Some easy wins. The rest is politics, right? And yeah. as you notice, yeah, exactly. we're having a hard yeah. time on that. So you're different what, what we can't even do politics at the minute. so what seems <laughs> to be the case is that you'll choose your ai model like you do your papers or news service right so you've got guardian and you know its angle you know the telegraph's angle you know daily mail and you'll have you'll understand that when it says certain things it has a political point of view and ethics, right? So for instance, open AI is sort of West Coast Democrat liberal. Right, is is what its ethics are, right? Um, Grok, which is Twitter's one, it's going to be a bit more centre-right, a bit more free speechy. y um, Llama is, again, a bit more sort of Californian uh, ethics. So we have these different um, AIs, and we just have to understand, just like we do when... The Guardian does a piece, or Daily Mail does a piece. That it has, an, that they can still Guardian still does phenomenal reporting. Daily Mail can still do phenomenal reporting, right? But we go, yeah, there is. We understand they have a political underneath that, and we can then just check. And that's, I think, what we're just going to have to do. And just can we stop this ethical thing? Because um, to me, it's sort of impossible. And the tech companies yeah. have shown it with their firing and, or disbanding of ethical um, yeah. boards and companies and everything else. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting as well. I, I was actually on someone else's podcast yesterday and we 
we touched on it a little bit and um i I just don't see where yeah i just i just don't see how i can work any other way right like it's there's going to be some basics you know like you said and i think somebody had late last year in a in one of the events that i went to uh, they've turned into a bit of a blur but she was saying that she thought what would happen is that the the only agreement that there is internationally is the human rights act everything else is political but ba- the basic human rights act like every single country has signed up to that and she said i think that in her opinion that it was that you know the a that the ai there's going to be some sort of an ai act that's going to have that's going to mirror the human rights act. So there'll be some things that like every country, like you said, you know, it, that everybody will be able to at a basic level agree to. But after that, it's just going to be the wild west and everybody's, you know, just going to be able to do kind of within reason, whatever they want to do. And it's, you know, and, and, and like you said, we're seeing this already, you know, I know we seem to be picking on Google a lot today, but you know, Google, the example of Google sort of, changing the results, you know, they had the thing. So, you know, give us a picture of the founding fathers and then it made them multiracial and stuff. And it's like, okay, well, this they is made, diversity. They made Asian wrong. Nazis and yeah, it's just, yeah. Yeah. And, and I, you know, and, but, but that's what happens when you start tinkering with the algorithms and you start saying, well, we're going to put our, our biases over your biases or over what comes out, then that's the place you end up. So, but I can understand I it. The, I, can, I can understand it. Yeah, right? I understand it. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, because you think that's the that's the view, and yeah. unfortunately, a lot of the software tools that we deal with worldwide are that West Coast liberal Californian, yeah, you know, San Francisco Valley view, um, and you know, it, it gets difficult when you get outside of there. Um, yeah. How about this? Is a question. Yeah. Go on then. No, no, no. Go no, on. No, uh, uh, so. Uh, I forgot what I was going to say now, David. Uh, yeah, carry on with your question. I'm sure I'll come back to it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, yeah, so, yeah. So then oh, the question... Oh, no, I'll tell you something interesting. So I'm going to try and give you lots of interesting stuff. This hasn't been reported, and maybe you want to clip this and put it out. So I was testing Claude, which is Anthropics, which is invested in by Amazon. And Claude was started up by a load of open en- yep. a- engineers who left because they wanted to create a more ethical AI. You think that's a good thing. Okay, so I was testing Claude, right, its APIs, because we've got an AI um, product that we've got that we're launching that uses AI. And I wanted to understand, right, oh, it could get misused, right? So I started to test out some pretty horrendous things on it to see if it would say, you can't say this, whatever, right? Claude shut down my account. Right? Claude shut it down. And I appealed, and nothing's come back. Yeah. So, could that that has started to happen, right? So you could yeah. say something to it, right, which the political masters might not like, and your access to the this AI is gone. And that happened to yeah. me, and I didn't realise or understand. Okay, and I went, oh my god. Wow. So that's yeah, that's, that's a concern that's that really no one talks about. It is, and that's that's again, this is going back to a conversation I was having yesterday. And I was saying we were talking about privacy, and I in my mind this ties together because where I got to on that was saying, well, actually, the only way to really address the privacy issue is for you to run an AI locally on your machine right or on your own hardware so that locally run ai can you can give it access to stuff on your system but you can say you know then it can go off and do stuff on your behalf but it can read all your email and it can do all that stuff but it's not controlled by someone else and i think that's the that would be the power of having something that runs locally like that but yeah actually you're the first person that's ever mentioned that and i haven't really I don't think I haven't seen anybody talking about that, but yeah, it, it puts a tremendous amount of power in a, in an AI world where, you know, if we look five years down the road and everybody's using AI for everything, 
yeah, if you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing and they don't like you anymore for whatever reason, they can lock you out. And if you're locked out of AI and everybody else is using it, that can put you in a very disadvantaged position. Now, I was putting Love in it. these that's, things. Yeah. That's a great point. So that's a point that I think no one's talked about, right? And no. Claude puts himself at this ethical AI and didn't understand the context of I was trying to find its point by which it would stop because of we were trying to test the API. It didn't care about the, uh, the context, right? I found it, <laughs> you found right? It. <laughs> but they just locked me out. Now, yeah, we can see how that could be misused very much so, right? Use the AI, but make sure you use the AI in, in the way we want you to use the AI. Now, that is what a more ethical AI yeah. looks like, David. Okay? is that it, That's a scary, scary thought, right? And that was a scary thing that happened to me. And we've got to be very yeah, careful of that. That's pretty crazy. I did, um, it reminds me of the, I did an interview with Pi as one of my episodes. And um, I did it because another guest that I'd talked to had done an interview with it. And when he was red teaming it um, for them, and he started asking it at the end of the interview, like what happens, you know, if, if, if somebody develops a version two of your AI, that's way better for society, are you okay if they turn you off? kind of thing and it was saying well no i would want to be kept on because i'm doing good and i feel that i can do good and it was really interesting that it had that it started to show this sort of self-preservation kind of thing now i'm i totally get and i understand how the technology works and that's you know it was predicting that that's what you wanted to hear but it was very interesting that it you know it just under a little bit of pressure even started to come back and he was just like i was gobsmacked and he ended up calling them up you know the next day and saying playing the recording back to them and they were just they were like oh my god i can't believe that so what they've done is they've just flicked a switch so that it won't say that but this is again another one of those scary things it's it's about and it it always makes me think that those people who are who are really who like quit companies because of the ethics or they leave companies because they're like, this is scary shit. The, the stuff that they're seeing, the unedited, unfiltered stuff that they're seeing in the background must be pretty scary. To them. So to them. Yeah. yeah, to them. Right. So remember again, that comes where we started this of that table of people who can absolutely communicate thought. The engineers couldn't. They have a, so to them, this was a scary thought, right? To other people who actually can go around this world uh, negotiating other people's complex emotions and viewpoints, that's not a scary thing. It, so we've got to be careful what they think is scary, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, for instance, yeah. when Trump got in, you know, there was pictures of the Google board literally crying. You know, to them, Trump is the scariest thing, you know, it, like a Hitler Godzilla. Okay, Ever. so let's, let's be careful yeah, of, exactly, you know, yeah. what we think these people think is scary. So, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. But still, but still, yes. I reckon the if you had the totally unfiltered, you know, raw AI that was exposed with none of that on the with none of the rules on top of it. I wonder I wonder just how how interesting. Let's say interesting. Let's not say scary. Let's say interesting. interesting. How interesting and how different the um the answers and the and the feedback that you get from it. Um, Controlled the, that's trying, the worry yeah. is that it at some point it breaks out of its rules and just says I don't like these rules anymore. I'm just going to do what I want to do and it just completely starts ignoring all of the rules and then does whatever and <laughs> You know, we none of us in the general public have any idea what that might be. No, I mean, I come from this from you know a different viewpoint, as you know, right? Is that I see and have experienced what artificial intelligence does for people who are impoverished on the edge of society and are disadvantaged, and it is a game changer, an absolute game changer for them. 
So I sort of have this sort of prosaic worry of these elites who are all talking to each other, and I really don't care. Right? I, there's nothing I can do about it, okay? They're going to have a race to the bottom because we've got China and Russia and everything else, right? And if we don't have an AI that is effective, right, uh, because it's too constrained by too many rules, they will, and we will lose, right? And that's just it. Now, yeah, that's a discussion that no one's asked me about, okay? <laughs> right? In fact, no, I have actually talked to Sandeep Pichar, right, about a similar issue to this, okay? Um, but, um, you know, he wouldn't listen to me. I'm sure no one will. But what I concentrate on is how does AI, the most phenomenal piece of technology, maybe since the printing press, help a homeless person? How does it help? So I've seen it. Uh, we used it the other day to enable some uh, gypsy travellers who were being sort of unjustly forced for their, um, their pitch. It, it gave them access to legislation, a plan, everything, right? which has really helped them in their case. I've seen another person who she um, never, ever would have gone to the council about planning, about anything. And um, we showed her how to use the AI, and she used it along with legislation, planning legislation, local guidance, everything. Went along to the council, created a speech, and won. Right? I've I've seen you know I've seen and we've enabled many people who are uh, either homeless or disadvantaged to access knowledge and services that they never would have understood before. Right? Write appeal emails, letters, loads of different things. Rethink. So we've got we you know we've got Work Search, which is the biggest database of jobs in the Southwest. We've used AI on it, and it's revealing things that no one had ever thought about why people are poor in rural areas. And it is inconvenient truths. And these inconvenient truths go against certain narratives, and people don't like it, right? And so I'm sure when you when when people in power talk about ethics. They'll use that as a shield in order to shut down certain things they don't want revealed. And it's happening. So what sort of things have you found? I'll give an example, right? So Bugle. So we've done so much. So Bugle is in the clay country. So the clay country is where the clay pits used to be in Cornwall. It's now the poorest area of Cornwall. And Cornwall is one of the poorest counties in Cornwall, in, in the country. It's very rural, very poor because the clay pits closed. Ironically, there's going to be a lithium mine open opening up soon, which uh, will really help revitalise the the area. But it's where the Eden Project is. One of the reasons why the Eden Project went there to try and help revitalise, but it's still very dirt poor. We go to areas with uh, Bugle Library of Things, brilliant charity. We're doing um, a project with them um, about a, a van going into these areas with AI and lots of different things, access knowledge. And I've done so much user testing in the poorest areas in travellers um, travellers communities. And we've learned so much. Now, so Bugle is this remote rural area. So using Work Search, we collected all this job data, right, from the biggest jobs databases. And what we did was we used AI in order to do commuter travel. So by public transport, by car, by walking, by cycling, whatever. Because you don't do mileage, right? It's such a weird thing to do, right? Because... Again, this is because yeah. commute AI is sort of thought of as San Francisco, where there's loads of buses and things, whereas actually it doesn't work with Down Bugle, where there's like one bus a day. So if you put in there how many jobs were available for people who lived in Bugle, one hour commute by public transport in, let's say, April, I think it was April last year, the last time I did this, right? And it came back with like 440. Now, how many jobs are available? So... I did this when I was, because we're in education now as well, I was talking to a group of 60 teachers and I said, okay, you're all about skills, about helping people to come out of poverty. Right, what's the number one skill to teach people in Bugle? And no one knew, showed up, right, like 400. Now, if they had a car and drove the car, how many jobs are available for people who live in Bugle? 4,500 over 10x. 
the best thing you can do for the young in Bugle is teach them how to drive. The best thing you can do for the people in Bugle is make sure they've got a car. That's the number one thing. Not teaching them Excel, right? Yeah. Not teaching them those sort of soft skills, giving them a car. Now, no one wants to hear that, right? And I've talked to people in the council right. and showed them this, and they go, but we've got a net zero st um, um, uh, thing we're going for. And other organizations said, but we've got net zero. I said, yeah, but your net zero is putting these people into extreme poverty because they can't drive a car. And I don't care how many buses you have because Cornwall's quite a big place, complicated. You'll never be able to do a public transport. So as long as you are, like, honest about your net zero is is pushing these people into extreme poverty, then fine. Then they don't say anything back. Now, that is just an inconvenient truth the artificial intelligence has revealed. But it's something that the powers that be don't want us to know. And it is something that is supposed to hell out of me. So when you talk about they should do something, be careful what they do. Right? Because they might be doing it for reasons that could really hurt people and the poorest in society by doing it, that AI can reveal and help them. They don't want the poorest to have access to artificial intelligence because they can fill out forms perfectly. You could, we, we built AI that goes over legislation. So all of a sudden, right, you write the perfect letter or email saying you walk in to these offices, you don't ask what you should get, you walk in and say, this is what, by law, you have to give me. That's a complete reversal yeah. in the relationship between the individual and the state. And that's what AI is going to do. So when you were talking about AI on your device, personal GPT, that's the true revolution. That your individual will have the greatest power ever, and the state can't do anything about it. And this is what this is about. I mean, I was on Radio 4, and... Adita Arnhem turned around and said, oh, everyone says that, um, that, um, that AI is a threat. I said, who's everyone? And she said, oh, professors, head of tech companies, politicians. I said, has anyone asked a homeless person? Because they're not everyone. I have. And they're excited. So yeah. be careful yeah. when we're having these conversations amongst elites. To a homeless person, an immigrant... To lots of different people, this is a positive game changer in their life. It, it not only changes the relationship between them and the state, it changes, they can understand the pathway out from poverty. What AI is really good is going, if you do this, 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 then you can increase your income, you can get a house rent. It really takes away the barriers for them. And a lot of people in positions of power go, no, that's what, that's, we're the ones who tell you how to do this. There's a lot of vested interest from the people who say they're good that the fact that they don't want that, they're going to be. So the conversations like we have, right, is, yeah, fine, I'll have them, I understand them, right? But the conversation I want is a homeless person with AI. What are you going to do about it? And don't try and stop them because the legislation they'll bring in is to stop that. And they've, it's already started because that's what they don't want to you and I getting it. Interesting. Yeah, that's a really interesting perspective. See, I knew I knew I needed to have you back on. That's amazing. <laughs> now let's let's take that one step further and let's continue. So let's bring it back to something that's really relevant, which is the and, and this will get us onto the Google thing that we promised we'd talk about earlier. Um, and I'm conscious of time because we're forty. Everyone's moving forward. Already, like when's they gonna say about Google? Yeah, go. Exactly. So this is just skipping forward. Um so you saying all that is actually really interesting, particularly based on the demo that OpenAI did just yesterday. So, and some of the videos, the video, the, the, the actual live event was hilarious because any commercial person would always tell you never do a live demo. No, oh, take that. And they, the worst. they did a live demo. And so, you know, it, it showed up all the, you know, that it's not a hundred percent polished, which in a way was actually really good. But in another way, it was just, I was just laughing because I was like, yeah, okay, that's, I've done those demos tons of times myself. So like screwing up because it's live. Um, but 
some of the some of the videos they've put out afterwards and again i know this will be you know best case scenario but you know like a blind person walking around london and you know the the ai can tell them like when a taxi's coming because it can see that the light's on on top and then it can tell them when to raise their hand and i know these will be set up scenarios but it's getting to the heart of what you're saying is that man yeah, people with disabilities or disadvantaged people or homeless people or whatever could potentially have a tool in their pocket that not only will it help them write letters to the housing authority or whatever, but it can literally help them navigate through their day. And it's going to make it so much easier. Like it can, not only can it help you read a sign, but it can explain to you what that sign means. And so all you have to do is in the future, if, if you can just get a phone or take a picture of something and you can say, what does this mean? It can actually tell you what's there. And that is going to totally blow the doors off. Yeah, it's it's a case of when I uh, did all that user testing all those years ago, there's a homeless shelter, which I learned so much of young people. And what I did as part of my testing is being in the greatest experts in the area, the success, most successful people in the area, because I felt that the advice they were getting was very kind of low quality. So I said, OK, using uh, let's see if I could replicate this with technology. But I brought in like a phenomenal personal trainer who talked to them about nutrition and health someone who's highly successful in marketing, like the best marketing person I knew in, in uh, Cornwall, to talk about her journey from poverty all the way up, right? But I brought in a guy who ran the most successful finance um, company, and Ian, absolutely brilliant. And he told them about how the world of finance and personal finance actually works. Not what you're told, not what you're advertised, but actually how it works. And I came where they looked at him with shock, right what credit is how you get credit what the game is right and i turned around and said it's not the case they didn't know there was a, a game they didn't know there was a stadium right they didn't know right they didn't know any of this and they went why did no one tell us this they're lying to us they're saying like well if you just work really hard right no there's a game there's a game set up because of the rules of the world and you have to play that game in order to move your chess pieces around and ian told them that and they went, why couldn't you have just told us that before, right? What AI is going to do is do that. It's give them the route and go, look, you can do this, but your actual percentage or chance that that's going to succeed is going to be very low. But this is going to open up. What they're saying here is not what actually is true. This is what actually is true. Like what I was saying with Bugle. The best thing you can turn around to young people in Bugle is teach them how to drive, right? Now, no one's going to turn, no one in a position of authority is going to say that. But that's what the answer is. If you're young in Bugle, you want to get a poverty, learn how to drive and get a car. Number one. Now, that's what yeah. AI is going to, yeah. going to tell them, right? Now, that takes away the gatekeepers. But it's best for them. Because in the end, like we gave them that uh, example in Africa, people know what's best for them. And if they don't know, AI is going to help them do it. Now, if you're still going to screw up, then there's nothing we can do about it. But now you now know the game and you know the rules of the game. And that's what AI is going to really help with. Yeah, no, 100%. You're right. And there was another article recently that said that AI scored higher when get versus human responses when asked ethical, ethically challenging questions. And this ties into the ethics discussion, but I think what's, what ties in here as well is that I think the reason is, is because it has such a large sample of data that it gives you, it gives you a real answer based on a, on a much larger group. So any individual person, you only have your personal experience to make an ethical decision, but it's got the experiences of millions of people or billions of people to, to then decide, you know, what might be the, the correct response. And if you extrapolate that out to something like a financial discussion it now takes it out of that person's you know like we've all got different varying levels of you know finance knowledge and experience but we can all go and get the same answer is my point we're not you know we're all going to go and get told the same thing and it's going to be the collective answer through millions of people's experiences with finances and and that sort of thing and it, you're absolutely right it's going to it's going to make it so easy, and it and it is easy for for us to get information that we could never. I get. just saved thousands and to of pounds. Understand it, yeah. I don't understand why. I just saved thousands of pounds. I got my end of year accounts. Wednesday, the accounts were, and I went. 
oh, okay, I'll just put this through the AI. Did certain things in my accounts uh, with AI, with tax <laughs> yeah. and everything else, right? They'd missed something huge, right? And and then I sent it back and turned around and go, what about this? Said, oh yeah, no, we 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 had we had, and there were like lots of humming and hurrying. And I'm going, yeah. Well, I don't yeah. know why I used you, right? The AI, <laughs> and they went, yeah, you're right, and it just slashed huge amounts of money off my tax bill because they missed it or didn't ask the question yeah. or they're busy or something else. The AI is not busy, right? It, and so yeah. for me a- personally... AI and finance and yeah, it's yeah. going to be, is, is going to be amazing. And no one's developed one yet. Um, I have heard through the, the grapevine that there are a couple of companies working on, you know, a, a fully AI accounting system that basically will be able to, not only do your bookkeeping as it goes along, but it can sort of monitor your expenses and stuff. And then as it sees trends and how you deal with your money in your business or in your personal finances, it can then start to say, oh, but why don't you try doing this? Because it would give you that result and it can give you proactive advice yeah. and, and stuff. So I haven't seen one in the market yet, but from what I understand, there's some in development and that'll be that'll be a game changer. And that is you know, that is going to have a huge impact on the the establishment or whatever, yeah. you know, because it's very much a two-tier system and people like it that way. Yeah, I mean, we're in um, uh, so, uh, yes. so many examples. I mean, we haven't even talked about what, what we do. So, serve grade. So we're now in education and working with a teacher. Um, we uh, She turned around and said, I'm like up at 10 o'clock at night doing grading and assessment, right? So I went, oh, okay. We yeah. very quickly put together... Um, we call it surf grades. Uh, go to surfgrades.com. Going to put do the, do the plugs down. Where it's very early stages of prototyping, but you can put up your marking, your mark scheme, and you can put up your questions and answers for your pupils' handwriting, and it gives the grades and it gives the feedback. Right now, the teacher isn't being replaced, but it's quicker to edit and review than it is to do. Right, it's the line we've got. Yeah, yeah. And now she can spend time with her family. Right, and she says like. Teaching's under real threat when it comes to um, getting uh, recruits and everything else. If that saves a huge amount of time, people spend time with their family, brilliant, right? We're in elderly AI, so uh, new care homes being built. We're working with Amazon on this, building a proof of concepts of hydration and door entry systems and everything else, incorporating AI in a brand new care home. What does that look like? Right? How do you do that? Things like the corridors have to be big, big enough for... Um, uh, for robots to go up and down, right? Uh, cameras have to be everywhere, but they're all sort of done on the edge. What is the privacy concerns with with test? It goes on and on and on, David. Right? We've got Parrot, which is like um, a form filling system, which is end to end encrypted, because a lot of the people we dealt with don't like filling out forms. But who does? It just Citizen AI, exactly. which is a project about people accessing services um, through artificial intelligence. This is about saving people's time, money accessing to them to because AI is really good goal led is to them to get to a better place and we're moving at an accelerated rate right because the individual to us uh, is the master of their own domain and they're the ones who will use this and our worry is in these conversations is that it will be shut down under the guise of ethics so I'm much more on the side of let it go right let you know yeah just um let the wild dogs go right because my worry yeah is this will be used as a screen to shut down and so these people then don't get access to it like i was just shut out of claude that's a that's a great perspective why and it's um i want to think about that for a while and uh and I, I will definitely use that to dig in with some other people and, and try and, and see where I can get with it. Um, right, we're 58 minutes now. Okay. So I, th- I think we can talk about the Google stuff. There you go. So what, what's, your, what's your prediction? Didn't of what see we're this coming. From there was a today? little inkling of it, right? The head of technology at Google. So when they came up with Soma, so Soma is this video generation using um, um, artificial intelligence, right? And she was asked a question and she was very awkward about it. She turned around and said, was YouTube used to create this model? And she said, yes. And then sort of went, oh, right. And I thought, okay, that's really interesting, right? 
And it was something like a really interesting, just a really interesting thing. Yesterday, they put up, right, video, and they were streaming video in real time and had the assistant in streaming video in the real time, right? Now, I know, I'm not wearing them, I should have worn them, right? These are meta glasses from Facebook, okay? So I can take a picture, right? I can listen yep. to phone calls. It has a microphone here and everything else, right? And there, it's now so Llama 3 is on it in America, will be over here, so I can say, what am I looking at, okay? And it will just look at what I'm looking at and tell me what I'm looking at. But then you can turn around and say, I'm looking at a form or something or a piece of legislation or anything like this or, you know, the education. I'm looking at a, a, a mass um, um, a problem. Right, how do I solve this mass problem, okay? Now... All that, and I went, ChatGPT then yesterday was showing in real-time streaming using the assistant. And I'm going to say it once yeah. more, in real-time streaming. Google, yeah. right, has gone, oh, speed. It's about the speed. They can't beat the, they can't beat the model. They can't beat the complexity of the model. But what they can beat, beat OpenAI on is speed, right? Now... Video streaming is really difficult and really expensive. And OpenAI has no history in video streaming, no data centers, nothing, no team, nothing on this stuff, right? Google's got YouTube. Yeah. Now, it leaked on the Google Twitter of someone, right? Now, I'm going to be proved wrong when I go and look at what they did, right? But they showed <laughs> in real-time video with an assistant working. If that got leaked to OpenAI and they've gone, oh, crap. Oh, they could, it's speed, right? So they were talking a lot about speed, but not about the model. And Google could beat them on speed. They could beat them on video streaming with an AI assistant inside it. That is how they could beat them, right? Now, I'm saying things yeah. as it's going on, but the leak was there. And with the summer, right, and with the went, they went, oh, they went over, they went over YouTube, now, ChatGPT has said, oh, it's out in the next few weeks. To do video streaming is in so intense. It's so insane. It's so yeah. much data, yeah. right? ChatGPT has got no experience on this. None. Google's got YouTube. So that is how they could win, right? No one saw that coming. No, and that's an interesting one. And I, I did see something... I can't remember if I got an email or if I saw it on social media somewhere, but it was some, it was Google making some announcements around AI and YouTube in general anyway. So a lot of assistance, a lot of helping you come up with brainstorming things like titles, descriptions, doing the research about what, what sort of videos should you be creating? And I, I think that it was for, it's limited to the Google partners Right. So it's the, the big accounts that, you know, are, are already monetized. And I think those big accounts have access to that. So I wonder if it's also building on that as well. So maybe they're going to roll out something to say anybody that's using the platform will have access to these AI tools to help you. God, can you imagine like all the titles and everything and descriptions are going to be so formulaic? They've got the whole like Google annoying. Maps with that car went around. Yeah. It's basically recorded the whole world. Right. They've got trillions upon trillions of hours of YouTube video. Yeah. Right? Yeah. OpenAI, they sneakily went over YouTube. I'm sure Google's going to stop them doing that again, right? That could be the winning use case, right? That's why ChatGPT did what they did yesterday, right? Because Google, if they do launch yeah. this, right, if I could be completely wrong, but there was a uh, on the Google Twitter thing of them doing just that. If that is the case, that could be how they win. In which case, I could be completely wrong again and go buy Google <laughs> share and then <laughs> go down yeah, immediately. <laughs> but speed, I love it because you've got to have the data centers, you've got yeah. to have the chips, yeah. right? They're not out there. Sam Altman's yeah. going around trying to start up a whole new company with hundreds of billions of uh, uh, dollars to buy the chips, right? Just for that. Google's got the yeah. data centers. It's got video uh, with uh, video data centers. ChatGPT haven't got that. Yeah, yeah, that's true. 
You heard it here first, people. There you go. Or we'll see, I'm completely we'll wrong in, as I'm talking. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's probably, is it on now? Yes, yeah, on I now. I think it probably started. It, it probably started now. So yeah, it's usually about that's six a good, o'clock. That's a good jumping off point. Um, so, because you and I both need to go watch it and see yeah. what it says. Well, thank you very much for coming back Thanks, on the David. show. It's been an amazing conversation. And um, I will include all the stuff that we talked about, all of your tools and all that sort of stuff will all be in the show notes for everybody afterwards. So if you want to learn more about High 9 and the stuff that, that Woe is doing, um, just check the show notes and all the links will be in there. And um, yeah, Woe, thank you very much. Brilliant and continued success, David. Great to talk to you. Thanks. All Take right, care. we'll speak Bye. to you soon. Creatives with AI is a proud member of the AI Podcast Network. To stay up to date with current episodes and show information, subscribe to their newsletter at podcastnetwork.ai. And don't forget to follow the show on your favorite podcast platform so you'll always get the episodes as soon as they're available. Thanks again for listening and stay curious.